We began talking about their composition in the first video. The lighter color materials lie in the inner part. But what was never said is that this very material had been dug up. It hadn't just been cleared, it had also been extracted, which would leave the surface smoother, but also a deeper terrain. And we aren't just talking about a small fraction of land. If you have seen previous videos, you will know what we're talking about. And if you haven't, we kindly suggest that you take a look at what's in there in order for you to understand the sheer size of the elements that form the lines of Nazca and also the typologies that we find in there. Once you learn all this, you will understand the extraordinary effort taken by our ancestors in order to construct such a magnum opus. But let's proceed. Where did they place all these materials? That's one good question, and before we continue with the video, we would like you to try and make a guess in the comments. Might be that many of you uh, can find the right answer. So here, we'll tell you something that nobody knew before. Separating the darker, rockier material from the lighter, more clay-like one underneath, the rocks that form the darker material would assemble forming walls, which would be seen from the sky appearing as lines. These walls were not only formed by the darker rocks, but were also strengthened and put together by the clearer, lighter, more clay-like material that had been dug up previously in the inner part of the lines and other greater structures in there. But where is that material nowadays? That is right. As of today, we can only see the rocks, and they don't look much like a wall at all, as they are all piled up and often scattered. This is because today, what we can appreciate is the dark, decayed skeleton of what once were walls of triangular shape, and this is because the lighter clay-like material that kept them together is now gone. Surprised? Had you imagined them that way? Hang on, as we will now tell you why it's not there anymore and where it went. Said material, to be fixed, needed constant maintenance. It was also necessary to put some pressure on it, as well as something that will render you speechless. Moist. And some of you might ask, what do you mean moist, if it's a desert we're talking about? But hold on, because we haven't gone insane. Remember that we have scientific proof. So, having been abandoned, lacking maintenance, and especially having dried up completely to the desert sun, this clay-like material began to crack. And let us remind you that this is sand we're talking about and not stone. As years, decades, centuries and millennia passed, this dry and mince material, now turned into dust, began to scatter all over the desert due to the wind's action. Grain by grain, particle by particle. The darker stones, which are heavier than air, remain in its place, stripped of that mortar that allowed them to form two meter tall walls. For this reason, we affirm that these are not simply accumulations of rocks. Furthermore, not only the wind is responsible for this destruction, but also the action of runoffs, that is, currents of superficial water caused by torrential showers that happen sporadically in these semi-desertic areas that are responsible for it too. Surely, you may still be wondering, what about the water? How could those huge, kilometer-long walls be maintained using such a precious resource in the middle of a desert? That's plain crazy! Well, it is not. In fact, that was the easiest part. But, as we often say, that's something that we will talk about in a future video. What many of you will be wondering is, how could those geoglyphs be one meter and a half tall? Where are all those stones then? Well, the thing is, they've never been in there. The walls or low walls that form these lines had different thickness and different heights. Not all of them were so tall, to be sure. Depending on the thickness of the line, the walls would be taller or shorter, thicker or leaner. When we refer to bigger structures, the walls were thick and tall. And in the case of some lines that are two meters wide, the walls could reach up to a meter and a half in length. But in the case of the geoglyphs, walls never got past 20 centimeters. All these lines underwent the same treatment, except for the geoglyphs in the hillsides, and which can be seen from below. These figures, which uh, have, we have addressed in previous videos, had a different role and were only formed there by mere mounds of rock. You may be wondering where the evidence is, and well, it is everywhere. 
Even in the well-known central plains, the piece of land where we can find the famous tower from which every year many a tourist ceaselessly observes the lines. Right there, surrounded by plenty of these structures and for anybody to see, we can find sections of partially collapsed walls. Parts that, even today, can be appreciated as well as the materials have crumbled by time and the elements. Our team found this through fieldwork and also the invaluable assistance of drones. There are also numerous evidences of these lighter color terrain's lowerings, the one that served as mortar for the extensive walls of sand and stone. The truth is, when we speak of these structures, people imagine them being at a ground level, but that's not so. Many of these still preserve a certain depth, visible to the naked eye. Furthermore, there are a multitude of lines that travel across slopes, appearing as mounds or small hills, which have been dug up in order to walk across the line through its very core without having to walk around it. The digging labor in these slopes must have been uh, carried out by tens and tens of tireless workers back in the day. These examples are visible even today, even for a satellite. There is much, much more to unveil. We will also have to answer questions about their design. How were they designed? How did they manage to make them so straight? How were they oriented through such enormous extensions of terrain? How could they draw such gigantic figures without mistake, creating such complex silhouettes without having to see them from the skies? Those questions remain for the next video, named How were the Nazca lines designed? And now, smash that like button if you've liked the video, subscribe if you please, and don't forget to hit the bell so you are aware of upcoming episodes, each of which will draw you closer and closer to the biggest question of them all, and for sure, its answer. What are the Nazca lines? I'm Alberto Escudero, representing our director, Carlos Enrique Hermida, and this has been Salvar Nazca. Until the next time. Solo en YouTube.